This is Catherine Getsky, host of the Hope Matrix podcast. We are here to share science, stories, and strategies for how to hope. I'm the chief hope officer of the Shine Hope Company, and Shine is the mnemonic for how we teach hope. So when we talk about hope, we talk about how we use stress skills, happiness habits, inspired actions, nourishing networks, and eliminating challenges, which are our thinking patterns that get in the way of our ability to hope. Hope is a skill. You can measure hope, you can teach hope, and you can start practicing skills to activate higher hope in your life today. And on this Hope Matrix podcast, we aim to bring in guests, experts in science, people with stories, and those that have strategies for activating hope in your life. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome today to the Hope Matrix. I am super grateful to have you here, have you listening in. I have a fantastic guest today who I'm super excited to introduce you to. He has got such varied experience. He's a PhD from Stanford. He's worked with NASA, if I've got that right. His name is Zachary Burton, and he's also got a play he wrote that he's going to talk to us a little bit more about. He is living with bipolar, and, and he's going to share a little bit more about that as well, and we're going to look at it through the lens of hope. Um, again, just to kind of give that brief overview of the five keys to hope that we talk about, it's first identifying and recognizing that stress response. It is um, practicing your five keys for happiness or practicing your happiness habits, the things that keep you in that, what, what we call with young kids, that upper brain. It is taking inspired action using SMART goals, creating a strong network for hope, and then finally overcoming some current cha some challenges, common challenges to hopelessness. So super excited to have Zachary here to help us kind of look at all, all of these things, all, the, all of these things about hope through the lens of um, living with bipolar and some of the challenges associated with that and really how to use it for your advantage, I think. So um, welcome, long intro. Thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Catherine. It's, I mean, it's just terrific to be here speaking with you. So many components of what you're doing um, within this HOPE framework, you know, resonate so deeply. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, your background is so diverse and varied. How did you get, I mean, NASA to, you know, mental health to all of these different areas. Can you just tell me a little bit more about yourself and yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, it surprises me day to day to reflect on, you know, my path. I'm sure that's true of all of us, you know, we never know, <laughs> but um, yeah. So I started, I mean, originally by training through through undergrad and then my PhD as a geologist, um, so as an earth scientist. And that was how, you know, sort of related to my involvement both within the energy space and then within the space space uh, with NASA and um, with another institution focused on space research. So that's sort of what I would describe as, uh, you know, sort of like a day job in some regards is, is science. Uh, and recently I started as a, a scientific consultant for, a, for an engineering and consulting firm. So that's sort of that, that uh, you know, facet of my life. Then as you mentioned, I, so I live with bipolar disorder and that all culminated in actually during my PhD at Stanford, which I had just finished two months ago, but in May of 2017, uh, I had my first psychotic break, and that was basically the culmination of a period of months-long mania, um, sort of this um, heightened state, I would call it. Um, and after that psychotic break, which is in the early morning of May 8, 2017, I was hospitalized for a couple of weeks and sort of completely debilitated for, for months and months afterward. Um, and so that sort of set the stage for my own mental health journey. I also have a family history of, of very close loved ones who live with bipolar disorder or who did live with bipolar disorder. So in the wake of my diagnosis while at Stanford, my, um, my then partner and I, Elisa Hoffmeister, who's she's now a medical student at the University of Minnesota, we were reflecting on the fact that there were so few stories of hope. You know, I mean, when we talk about hope, when we're in these moments, this sort of depth of despair and uncertainty, um, 
you know, as we were just chatting about before we went on air, you know, it's it's just so necessary to have these hopeful messages, these uplifting messages, um, you know, alongside also confronting with some of the the truths that as a society we need to face, being that mental health needs to be addressed, um, depression, anxiety, um, conditions like bipolar and schizophrenia. And it, similarly, the sort of stigma around that was really what Elisa and I sort of fixed onto because sort of this realization that a lot of this silence and sort of lack of hope and lack of people speaking out was due to this tremendous stigma that mental health um, and mental health conditions still are subjected to in society. And so that sort of set the stage for my journey in the mental health space, the very beginnings. You know, I can delve into where we're at now, but that's that sort of sets the stage. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really very helpful um, and, and hearing your story and experience. And I think, you know, the reason I created this podcast is really to look at specific experiences people have and how you apply a hopeful mindset. And, and again, the first key, getting out of that despair. So how did you, you know, when you were diagnosed and, and in um, hospitalized and, you know, the two components of hopelessness are despair and helplessness. And I would imagine yeah. like, <laughs> incredibly, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Spot so, on. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what is the Other first... despair, hopelessness. <laughs> exactly. Um, what is, so what are some tools, like what helped you get out of, I mean, the first thing we teach our kids to is feeling those feelings, the yeah. sadness, the pain, and oftentimes we escape. So we run from them and that leads to greater, you know, problems like addiction and violence and all of these things. Yeah. How are you able to dive deep into, you know, your pain? Totally. I am. Um, I mean, what you say is spot on as far as being just thrust into this pit of despair and, and uncertainty and in like you said just a just this utter feel of hopelessness and being sort of out of control of my own life and my own really my own being which is a, a really strange experience sort of being um you know it was this feeling early on of being robbed completely of my identity and and suddenly not knowing anymore you know really who I was in the world it sounds sort of dramatic but really that was the experience um, I often talk about it as this crisis of confidence where you know I felt I was completely you know my ability to function both in a personal life but also in professional in the professional realm was just shattered it was just gone like that um and you know so I, I think as far as what was important to me in confronting and thinking about that, I mean, one was was time. Um, it didn't, you know, this, this sort of transformation um, and sort of climbing out of some of those feelings and that feeling of helplessness um, definitely didn't happen overnight as a process. Um, but I think it's so critical to me, it's some things I was fortunate to have where um, basically a, a tremendous support network. Um, so both family, um, you know, at the time, uh, a loving partner as well, very close friends, and then also a very supportive boss, who's, who's my PhD advisor, extremely supportive work environment alongside the personal environment. And, um, you know, I think um, I have mentioned before in, in some of your other podcasts is this Hope Network. And so I think for me, that Hope Network, those key people, um, really were life-saving um, in, in escaping and then sort of accepting my condition. Um, you know, there was a lot of pushback on my part. I went off my meds, had another psychotic break, wasn't hospitalized, you know, thanks to having that support network. Um, but I, you know, there was, there was a lot of confrontation um, on my own part with, with this label, a scary diagnosis that it, again is really stigmatized and, you know, oh my gosh, you know, look at that crazy person, look at that psycho, look at that, you know, whatever is sort of horrible um, stigmatized word you want to fix to it, you know, that was a lot to deal with. And then um, another sort of interesting facet was, you know, there's sort of that negative component of my sort of mental health diagnosis that I was, or perceived negative component I was confronting with, but also this idea that, oh, wow, if I'm on meds and I'm no longer manic again, I won't be able to ever do anything. I won't be able to achieve anything. I'm only at Stanford because I was manic. I'm only, you know, I only 
all of my accomplishments were just because of this manic state, which, you know, really isn't me. It was, it was just this um, condition. And so there was a lot to sort of climb out of there. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, that's such yeah. an amazing, it's a, it's such an important point too. I mean, a lot of people think they have to take these substances to get to that mania. And if they don't have that, they can't. Yeah. And yet it is pretty amazing. And for my, like, I've been sober a long time and being sober, I like without those substances, I couldn't create and it, it creates in different ways, but it yet, you know, being present, I, you know, you're, you're doing what you're meant to do and you, you know, you. Um, so keeping you healthy on the road, you know, to Absolutely, doing that yeah. is so critical. Yeah. So you went, so in terms of that despair, so you got therapy and um, medication and you were hospitalized. Did you, did you take on any practices like meditation? Like, is that something you explored or? Yeah. You you know what, what's actually sort of funny, I think, is that I was really exploring mindfulness, um, some components of meditation, um, prior to to my psychotic break so in early 2017 and, and my psychotic break was May and a lot of that actually was was thanks to my younger brother who still he he meditates up to you know two hours a day these days practices mindfulness intensively and is really helpful for him in his own life um, and for staying grounded and so I was just so inspired you know back in 2017 you know I would have been 24 and he was 22, 21 at the time to see sort of this transformation for him because, um, you know, his own journey was going from this state of being unhappy in school, being like president of a fraternity at a giant state school, you know, sort of super popular, you know, you could say on top of the world for some. Um, and so for him, he had this incredible transformation from that life into, you know, sort of feeling, finding much more meaning. And so that inspired me prior to uh, my own experience with mental health conditions and, and diagnosis. And I think these days, you know, for me, some of those practices aren't as explicit. I don't like sit down and, and, and go through um, sort of the motions of, of gratitude exercises, um, other mindfulness practices of sort of um, reinforcement of positive thoughts. Um, but all of those, I think, are are sort of tr can be tremendous tools for for some people, and for me, have almost become internalized. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, absolutely. As far as those practices, supplementing, you know, medications is sort of a baseline these days. I don't I don't really um, do much therapy, but but have family members who who um, gain so much value out of therapy as well. So I yeah, I think. Um, you know, as you said, it's sort of, it's this big combination. And, and for all of us, it, it varies, you know, as far as what's most helpful in recovery and sustaining that sort of hopeful, hopeful state. Yeah. And do you know what your triggers are? Like what triggers you into different states yeah. and how you manage them? Yeah, there, there are a few, and, and a few I was only sort of clued into because of my experience with this manic episode, psychosis, um, sort of, again, speaking with doctors in the wake of that, speaking with therapists, psychiatrists, family members who notice things, you know, I, I'm always amazed by how observant, um, how much more observant friends and family members are of, of myself um, than I am. <laughs> and so I, yeah, I think um, something I'm really, really thankful for, actually, in having experienced, um, in, in having experienced what I did is becoming a lot more aware, uh, you know, sort of who I am with, to include like certain triggers. Um, and so I, I, I don't know what comes to mind is sort of more generic triggers that, that to me aren't always true. Like, you know, a big one for me is, is sort of can be lack of sleep. Um, but I say this in these days, I sleep anywhere from two to seven hours a night. So it's, <laughs> that I've sort of managed as well. But I very much do notice, for instance, sometimes what, I'll, what I experience is like some sort of paranoia may set in on rare occasions. And it, for, for me, that is a clear sign that I'm sort of um, feeling a bit out of myself, um, unsettled, uneasy, I would say paranoia slash anxiety. And so when that happens, it's a good clue for me to get more sleep, um, sometimes take some of my... Um, 
think they're called PRNs, but basically as needed medication that I don't take all the time, take a bit of that, which also makes me sleep like 14 hours. <laughs> yeah. So de definitely, I, you know, there's not a, a big suite for me of, of specific triggers right now, but definitely have really increased my awareness, um, you know, of, of sort of my mind state. So. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And sleep is so, uh, you know, we've, that's so totally. much in the literature for, and for me personally, it's so important. And yeah, if I don't sleep, <laughs> look out. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also, uh, yeah. Also and with then, sleep too. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's hard to want to do so much and have so many, you know, to be so yeah. brilliant and want to, you know, and to like get our sleep. So it's really, yeah. It's this tough balance, right? I would always I hear know. like when I was in Silicon Valley of like, how can we optimize, you know, the minimal amount of sleep for the most productivity, most hours of work. Um, yeah, so yeah. totally. Um, yeah, wow. And what do you do to stay like healthy and happy? And I mean, do you work out? Do you like, what kind of practices? Do you watch what you eat? Do you? Yeah, you know, eating, um, sort of eating, healthily is is important to me you know that's um it, it's not something I'm like I would say sort of super stringent about at all um but I would say my habits before my experience were, were worse you know I would um I was sort of infamous for eating just frozen pizza and frozen burritos that I would scrounge from free grad school events and just survive <laughs> off of these for months at a time um but these days, much better. You know, I, I sort of uh, worship cabbage salads. It's a strange thing. But then um, just just in general, you know, relatively healthy eating. But I, you know, of course, like also enjoy, um, you know, a good like hamburger here and there. I, I'm not at all very stringent about it. <laughs> but I would say overall healthy, um, you know, probably too much coffee. But um, yeah, told, I, I mean, as far as these habits, you know, some others... Um, you know, that, that you mentioned in, again, in, in sort of the, this um, hope framework is thinking about things like, you know, art um, as sort of manifestation. We can talk about that because that, of course, relates to the play um, and a lot of my other um, interests. But, um, you know, another that, that you had mentioned in the framework that I really, that so much of my hopefulness and satisfaction and meaning derives from is volunteering. And so, you know, as far as my involvement with mental health, I mean, it's all volunteer. <laughs> and so it's sort of, I mean, it's, it's, it occupies more hours than any um, paid job I've ever had, far more. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it's, it is all volunteer. And to me, it, it truly does feel, you know, what, what ex literally has me sort of ecstatic and eager to wake up the next day after, you know, three or four hours is, um, is really this feeling of, of meaning and excitement around contributing to something you know, that, that matters in the broader, in the broader spectrum of things. So. Yeah, no, so important. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this play. I think it's a great yeah. segue to get in that, to learn about what it is and what you're totally. doing. Yeah. I'm so excited. So can you share more about that? Totally. Yeah. So I sort of set the stage um, with my own experience, um, no pun intended, but <laughs> Basically, in the, in the wake of that experience in summer 2017, which is, you know, super difficult for me, um, but I'll note that, you know, I think in many ways it was way more difficult for um, Elisa in the time and family members and friends because I wasn't aware. I was sort of out of myself in that point, like totally like it, if you talk to sort of my friends, Elisa, family members, you know, they'll say I, it was obvious, like I, it was as if my personality had just been stripped for, for a number of months. Uh, it was almost, you know, it, at some, at some points, the doctors, you know, sort of would describe when I was in the hospital or outside really as catatonic, um, really sort of a strange experience there. But I think, um, again, sort of what we're talking about, this lack of hopeful stories, um, you know, a lot of a lot of sort of the darkness that that surrounds um, these sort of mental health conditions. You know, these these sort of tragic um, and difficult and and dark stories available on the internet, sort of readily on the internet. That was part of the inspiration for Elisa and myself was to both 
you know, provide some more hopeful stories, but also just really provide a better representation of the true diversity of experiences that people have with mental health, you know, whether it's a diagnosed condition or not. Um, And so basically a year after in the summer of 2018, I came to Elisa and all I had was the name. I was like, we should do the manic monologues. And she was like, yeah, let's do it. And (laughs) so we... (laughs) We ran with it, which, which, um, you know, I'll use the word I, I don't often, but I'll use the word is crazy. Um, <laughs> and, and neither of us, you know, of course, here I was an earth scientist um, and she was a, a pre-med student at the time. And so neither of us had any experience with theater. I had like acted in a couple minor roles in high school poorly. Um, and so really, we were like total newbies, right? It was this ridiculous uh, uh, sort of undertaking. Um, but then basically in the fall of 2018, we we attended a, a NAMI event. You know, NAMI has a ton of these awesome awareness events. Met a couple folks, um, two professors actually, who ended up being very close advisors of ours and, and incredibly close friends to this day. Um, and it sort of was you know, started to build and take off from there. And so really, um, you know, the motivation in doing the Minot Monologues was to create a play that showcased diverse true experiences of mental health conditions to break down stigma. That's sort of the whole mission is to to disrupt stigma surrounding mental health. Um, And so in many ways, we were very much inspired, of course, by the Vagina Monologues, um, you know, which is done just such a such a tremendous amount to to destigmatize female sexuality, remove the taboo around female sexuality, and also to end violence, to end sexual violence toward women. And so that was a huge inspiration. There were a, you know a few examples too of sort of hopeful stories. Um, one organization that really inspires me as well is this is my brave. Um, and so their founder, Jennifer, we actually spoke the other week, finally, we sort of finally connected. And they do, basically, they empower individuals and communities to get up on stage, sort of like the moth or something like this, and share their stories live, sort of tremendous empowerment there, um, also in theatrical form. And so for us, what we did, um, you know, sort of instead as an adaptation was sort of more like what Eve Ensler did with the Vagina Monologues, where we collected stories from across the country, across Canada, a few, you know, outside of North America, and put together, you know, end of the day, 20 stories of all sorts of different diagnoses, bipolar, depression, anxiety, PTSD, schizophrenia, OCD, really trying to capture that diversity. And from a large variety of people. So people with conditions like myself, but also, you know, say um, a mother, um, you know, or a a son of a of someone with a mental health condition, um, you know, in some cases, a, um, a mental health care professional talking about patients, but also their own experience. Um, and so, you know, that was sort of the basis um, for this play. Um, and to sort of not be long-winded about that, which I already am, but it's just it's like, it's just, I don't know, it's so exciting on me to reflect and think on where we're going. But we premiered the play at Stanford in May of 2019 and were truly blown away um, because this was, you know, after us scrambling, you know, Elisa directing, running rehearsals, um, me sort of sitting in, providing pointers, Elisa and I throwing all these all these printed out stories we had received through Gmail on the kitchen floor in Palo Alto, marking them up with a red pen, sorting them, uh, me figuring out how to book like a 200 person theater, uh, <laughs> running all our marketing, reaching out to journalists, reaching out, just as tremendous. You know, we flew in someone from Vancouver in Canada. We flew in someone from Salt Lake City. Um, and so to reflect on it, I'm like, how? How did it? How did it come together? <laughs> it's yeah. It it just blows my mind, I, you know. And um and so we premiered the show three nights, completely sold out. Six hundred people basically attended. Um, 
and just tremendous reception. Um, you know, there's there's coverage by Washington Post, NPR, what have you, for the first the first performance. But sort of the most meaningful was audience members coming up afterward. Um, and those those moments like stick with me and and will forever. Um, and, and, I mean, one was just having my PhD advisor, who's who's one of the um, the seven deans at Stanford now come up to me afterward and it was the only time I've ever seen him cry, but Aww. he had just tears in his eyes. Um, and so that's, I, it could have never anticipated, um, you know, that reception and, you know, one thing that we were sort of shared during that performance, um, you know, in introducing the performance was, you know, it looks like Silicon Valley, it looks like the world is ready for these conversations. So. Yeah. And it's just taken off from there. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, so powerful. I mean, those human connections mm -hmm. and human stories. It's. Oh my gosh, yeah. There's yeah. nothing, yeah, there's nothing like it. The, yeah. the human element, humanization and empathy. Um, and just mm -hmm. art, art as well and narrative storytelling, so. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the one of the things I love about it, too, that, you know, we just talked about earlier um, before we got on, you know, I come at this mental health and very business oriented. And I think, how can we have the biggest impact for the smallest amount of funds? Because we're so limited in funding. Totally. And I love that you created it in a way that um, other people can use and adopt in their own city and run yeah. with. And, and so can you tell me a little bit more about how that works? Oh, I, I love that you brought that up because as you said, there's this huge dearth of funding for mental health. Um, you know, part of my involvement now is is working on, actually it's, it's a working group I'm a part of on financing global mental health. And so, as you said, yeah, just such a gap. Um, and so for us, you know, with the manic monologues, another part of what was it's so, so kind of wild for me to reflect on is that it was all bootstrapped, um, so to speak. So it was all done, you know, we applied for funding um, through Stanford, through some others, we sort of sought out funding, nothing, sort of all reject, rejected, <laughs> rejected, you know? Rejected, like, I know, we, hope to, yeah. Oh my gosh, we also sought out like partners, partner organizations, just simply student theater groups on, on campus, which you would think would be, would be um, sort of happy to take part, but you know, understandably they have their own season, their own shows. And who are these two like, you know, <laughs> geologist and medical student? Um, so, so no support there, which, you know, I can't blame people as well because like, you know, being sort of newcomers, unproven. Um, sure, I, I yeah. guess, you know. Um, right, right. And, and, and so, um, you know, for us, basically going through that, we were like, wow, like, this is possible for people with no theater experience. This is possible for storytellers with no acting experience. This is possible for people with no money. <laughs> This is possible for people without this tremendous social media PR team, possible for people without strong like community partnerships and being able to pull strings. This is possible for anyone. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, it, it totally intimidating. And I've, I've spoken to people since who've been interested in, in bringing the show in bringing a cast to their organization. And I get that because, you know, it's intimidating. Like, who am I to put on a play, right? Could be the thought. And so part of what the mission is with the Manic Monologues is to show people like, you can, you can do this. Like this doesn't have to be, this doesn't have to be Broadway. This isn't Broadway, you know, in most, in most situations. And so that's just sort of a core component is increasing access to these stories, but also showing people and, and hopefully empowering them to put on these stories themselves, to host these stories in their communities um, and so as far as, you know, how, basically how people can bring the stories, basically get in touch, you know, and I, um, I like to take, you know, I know in some cases, you know, with sort of traditional plays or playwriting, you know, a playwright will have their play sold through an agency and, 
you know, then it's kind of good luck to the production team, the director, but I really enjoy sort of interacting with with people who are keen to put on these stories. And so oftentimes I'm just sort of available via email, Zoom to to help people think through like how they're going to put these stories on, how they're going to adapt them. So this is meant to be, I mean, the Manic Monologues, it's meant to be sort of all of our experiences. Uh, it's meant to be for all of us. So yeah, that's the that's the so whole point. Cool. So yeah, I love that so much. Um, and so, are the scripts online? I mean, can people access the scripts, or how does that work? Basically, they get in touch with us, um, yeah. and so then and then we work together. We provide the script, um, may provide guidance, but in some cases, not. There's a there's a virtual performance actually coming up in April at a community college in Maryland, and so in that case, we interacted a bit. I interacted with one of the professors there. And basically gave her the script. And at this point, they're working on the production. So um, it can be anything like that to sort of hands off to very hands on, you know, working together. So it's. um, Yeah. Yeah, totally. So cool. I'm sure it's going to be really amazing for you to watch all the people. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) You know, adopting it. So cool. That. um, Yeah, I, I love that component of you know, as you said, stories um, is with this sort of thing, like every new presentation takes on a life of its own. And I also like to think of like, wow, those, the people who submitted their stories, like now their stories are being honored. Their stories are being showcased and highlighted, you know, in theory, eventually across the world by incredibly different, but incredibly similar individuals all over the world. So um, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Wow, this has been really wonderful. I do want to touch on just a couple more things and we'll put the um, links to how they get in touch with you in the kind of totally. summary. Um, yeah. So we, and we've talked about a little bit about inspired actions and I think you've given us some good examples of that and creating a strong network and the importance of a oh, network. Yeah. I mean, so key. Can you, what, can you, any advice for someone that feels really alone right now that doesn't know who to turn to that like where? Oh yeah. Yeah, I think that maybe that question has never been more important than, you know, now during the pandemic, um, being virtual, sort of lacking person to person contact. And so I think, you know, I think that, um, they, I, I mean, it's already sort of being covered, research is coming out, people are sort of talking about this, unfortunately, sort of very heightened burden of the pandemic increasing social isolation, depression, anxiety related to that. And so I, I try to think, you know, it's hard screen, like sort of talking on screen, but um, what I've found in my own experience, so that's sort of all I can really speak to there is, you know, the isolation has been difficult, you know, I was lucky to have, to have roommates uh, through 2020 and then now actually living with my younger brother and mom, um, so again, that connection in person, but I've also found, um, you know, somehow, even though it's still on screen on Zoom, I've really gained so much meaning through connecting with people literally across the world um, during the pandemic through, you know, Zoom, Google Meets, whatever, um, phone, the sort of silver lining is I've been doing that way more than before the pandemic. Um, and I've found that I've started working with some, some new organizations in the mental health space too, whether in the US or in Kenya or the UK, um, two examples. And I found that there's, it's almost a bit easier, a bit more accessible to, to get involved with others who are also passionate about things. And I think that for me, at least, that's very important for my own, my own support is support via sort of like common causes, volunteering, working together and sort of getting to know each other, becoming both friends and colleagues. So that would be my bid on that. But I do, I like, I also want to grant that it is, it is very difficult during these times. And so that's why I love, you know, trying to spread messages of hope that certainly the pandemic is, is way, way less than ideal, but I, I do hope or am hopeful that there are some ways to still connect with people. Yeah, absolutely. So important. Do you have any current challenges to your hope? Yeah, I, um, you know, one is, one is funding for mental health. Um, You know, I'm also very hopeful there. I mean, if you look at sort of 
national budgets um, as far as spending that is allocated towards mental health services within even just, you know, the pot that is allocated to health, it's minimal, (laughs) you know, as you said. Yeah, ridiculous. Um, And so that's, you know, that's tough, right? Because as you said, like that, um, you know, sort of both the support of private enterprise, private business, as well as government support, um, sort of um, public expenditure is is a critical piece of this recipe, you know, alongside more grassroots activity. Um, And so at times, you know, that's, that's a challenge, um, but I'm also hopeful and and things are being, things are are being done um, for increased spending by um, private and, and sort of public sector or mental sector. Um, That's that's an example. Yeah. 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 I mean, those that live with bipolar are, I mean, really some of the most brilliant, innovative, creative, people in the world. And so it's so important to me that, you know, we, we either use that energy for self-destruction or harm or for creative brilliance. And so you sharing your story and like giving, sharing strategies with others that are listening and how to really channel that energy for good and for the power of good and care for self is, yeah, so important. So I'm so thankful. Yeah to you for Thank you, yeah. joining us and for the work you're doing in the world and for taking care of yourself and for showing up every day. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah, as you said, it's a, I think in, you know, with mental health in general, diagnosed or not, it's a spectrum. And yeah. so each of our experiences are unique and also very similar to someone across the world or next door. Um, this belongs to all of us. You know, it's a, you know, as I often hear people say it, um, it's an equal opportunity part of the human condition. It, it affects all of us. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Is it Zach or Zachary do you prefer? Zach is perfect. I mean, you know, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Zachary Burton. Okay, got one, it. Yes. Sure. One, sure one, that's <laughs> yeah. one face, but no. It's yeah, <laughs> no. I love it. Yeah. And you just said you just recently finished your PhD. So I will call you Dr. Zachary Burton. Congratulations. <laughs> that's so Thank amazing. You. Yeah. Dr. Zach uh, works. Dr. Sort of I, <laughs> I love it. It's like it's like the doctor yeah. Doctor Oz, but Doctor Z or something like that. Oh yeah, I like funny. that. <laughs> Although it's not actual quotations because it's real. I, I've that's had true. I've met doctors that that call themselves with the quotations. Oh, like, that's a good. Yeah. It's good hilarious. Point. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been so fun talking to you, and I'm really grateful. Some really good advice, and I can't wait to see the play and share it with others. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, further. February. February 18th is the big virtual premiere. I didn't even okay, talk about perfect. that, but February yeah. 18th. And that's February free 18th. for everyone. Okay, cool. We'll put a link on all yeah. our social media channels so anyone can view it anywhere around the world free. Oh, anyone with an internet connection? Yeah. Free starting February 18th and then onward from that. And this will be, oh. this is, I'm just stunned. This has been in the works since August, 2019. This will be full Hollywood Broadway cast through mm-hmm. a nonprofit theater and dear friends at McCarter Theater. So I'm floored. I'm on the edge of my seat. I've been on the edge of my seat for months. So yeah. Wow. That's great. So excited. And, you know, like you said, providing access, I think that's the silver lining in the virtual world is access. Um, But also I want to thank you so much for what you do. Um, It's, you know, it was tremendous to read through, you know, some of the frameworks, breaking down both the science of hope and also strategies, these proactive strategies and empowerment that people can take on. So thank you as well for having me. Uh, This has really been wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thanks so much. And we'll put the links in uh, the bio and description. Um, The manic, manic, um, sorry, manic, the manic monologues, monologues, the manic (laughs) monologues. Is that the website manic monologues? Or, yeah, the website is themanicmonologues.org. Dot org. Okay, yeah, we'll put a link to it. But super excited. Can't wait to see it. And everyone should yeah. watch it and then get inspired to bring it to their towns and communities. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Have a great thank day. Thank you. You yeah. too. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, have a good day. Thanks for listening. So thank you all for listening in to the Hope Matrix podcast. 
Um, we want to shine a light that hope is teachable, hope is measurable and teachable, and provide you with actionable insights for how you can start activating hope in your life today and provide a framework so you can start talking about hope with other people and practice these skills together because we are better with hope. Please feel free to check out the shinehopecompany.com where we list all of our resources around how to hope. We have a lot of free programs for how to hope, including the five day challenge, our hope infographic with a lot of skills that showcase how to hope and articles of how to incorporate hope into your life. We have the Hope Beat Weekly, which is a weekly newsletter that shares strategies for hope. We have a My Hope Story template, so you can write your own hope story today. Uh, also my hope hero so we can share what our heroes are doing to activate hope in their lives and this is especially good with youth so they can start looking up to people that have overcome similar challenges to them and seeing how these heroes use the shine hope framework we have a hopeful minds for teens program a hopeful minds overview educator guides we have a new evidence-based college course so you can activate hope on the college campus there are programs in the workplace, overview courses, 90 minute courses for learning the what, why, and how to hope. What I want you to know about hope is it's a skill. You've got to practice these skills to become hopeful. It's easy to fall into despair and helplessness when we deal with challenges in life, and it takes intentional work and practice to get to hope. And yet it is always possible. So no matter what life brings, keep shining hope. Thanks so much for listening in. Have an awesome day. And of course, I've got to add this, that this program is designed to assist you in learning about hope. It should not be used for medical advice, counseling, or other health-related services. I, Fred, the Shine Hope Company, and myself, Katherine Getsky, do not endorse or provide any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I am not a medical doctor. The information provided here should not be used for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition and cannot be substituted for the advice of physicians, licensed professionals, or therapists who are familiar with your specific situation. Consult a licensed medical profession or call 911 if you are in need of immediate assistance. And be sure to know the crisis hotline, 988, if you are in need of support. Thanks a bunch for listening. Take good care of yourself and keep shining hope.